So hello, um, my name is Lisa Wichter, and I'm a speech language pathologist at Hennepin Healthcare. And today I'm going to be talking about the nursing swallowing screen and um, signs of dysphagia or swallowing disorders. Um, this is an important um, topic for our um, comprehensive and primary stroke um, certified um, facilities, as this is one of the um, primary um, features that they track um, um, for our, our stroke patients. Next screen, please. Um, so a swallow screen is an evidence-based um, performance measure that um, it's designed to pick up overt aspiration, so um, significant swallowing dis um, disorder. And also you want to um, to identify the patients that require a dysphagia evaluation by speech pathology. It's meant to be a quick and straightforward um, assessment using materials that are readily available. Um, our swallow screen and many of them use water um, because it's easily accessible and um, also patients are gonna be having trouble on something um, to swallow frequently, it's gonna be the thin ones. Um, we do want it to be completed as soon as possible after admission. Sometimes this is going to mean um, that assessments are completed right down in the emergency department um, or soon after um, patient arrives in intensive care or on the floor. Um, also, to keep in mind that um, a patient might have passed the screen, um, but then will have some neurologic change um, with deterioration, that means that um, you should reassess at that point um, because um, the, the condition may have changed as far as swallowing is concerned. And then and also another time when you'd want to repeat the exam, the screen, is after a patient's been intubated for a short period of time. Um, keep in mind that this screen must be completed be prior to patients receiving any oral intake um, um, for the stroke patients. And this includes meds and ice chips, any PO at all. So again, it's mandatory for the stroke patients, but it's also suggested for your high-risk patients as well. Next screen. Um, so who is at risk for dysphagia? Well, the, the main one we're talking about today is our, our stroke patients. So um, ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes, um, a lot of times they've, they have the um, unilateral um, um, oral motor um, changes, um, deficits that um, predispose them some, for some issues. Um, other populations, though, um, that you'll encounter um, would be traumatic brain injury or anoxic brain injury patients can show some um, also some issues. Also, um, more pervasive with your um, populations, just altered level of consciousness. So patients with delirium, they, um, those patients, think about them that might be showing confusion, impaired judgment, poor impulse control. That can include our strokes, but it can also include many other etiologies. Um, also, patients with cervical collars. Um, research has shown that these patients are actually three times as likely to um, have um, experience dysphagia and aspiration risk. Um, just by the, because of the positioning of the, um, that their head is in with the collars. Um, and this might include some of our patients, our stroke patients who have had a fall related to their um, hemiparesis. They might be on, have a cervical collar placed um, prior or just before their, their C-spines are cleared. Um, I'd mentioned previously to, um, to people that should be screened with those who have been intubated. And particularly those that have been intubated greater than 48 hours. Um, that with the it, it, um, ET tubes going between the vocal cords, it causes some decreased sensation and some swelling, and they are um, at higher risk for silent aspiration, at least that first 24 hours after extubation. Um, and then a couple other populations to think about, um, C CNS infections, so including um, encephalitis, meningitis patients, um, those with degenerative neurologic disorders, including ALS, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, and then also um, following some surgical procedures. Um, 
including cervical spine surgeries, head neck cancer resections, and parotid and arterectomies. Okay, next screen. Um, so next we're gonna talk about um, with your screen and with your patients, what you should be kind of honing in on when you're um, taking a look or assessing with the swallow screen. Um, some of the oral signs or the, the mouth signs of issues with swallowing um, can include drooling and excessive secretions in the mouth. Um, sometimes that drooling will be because of the facial droop. Um, the, it's allowing some of the, that saliva that's usually contained in the mouth to leak. Um, also with excessive secretions, what that gives you a little indication is that possibly the patient's just not reflexively swallowing as um, often as they normally would, and that can, can be a tip-off of some swallowing disorder. Um, with the facial droop, um, they can have, the, like I said, the loss of saliva, but also maybe some pocketing of food or liquids in the cheek on the side of weakness. Um, with, they can also show you know, the, the unilateral tongue weakness, and um, so after they swallow, you might see some food material um, adhering to the tongue or the, the roof of the mouth. And another tip off, um, especially you know, probably more during meals and not so much with your screen, but patient might be showing extended and complete chewing. So they don't, maybe it's the dentition, but also maybe it's the, the tongue and um, jaw weakness related to um, the dysarthria that um, it's going to put them, they're, they're going to have more difficulty with solids. Next screen. Um, now, talking about the pharyngeal signs of dysphagia next, um, and these can be a little more um, subtle to see, but um, also a little more dangerous for patients because um, that first one that's listed there, aspiration, that's the big one. So that means material actually entering the airway below the vocal cords. Um, if we can go forward to the next screen for a second. Um, and um, this is, shows a picture of the oral pharyngeal anatomy. And um, down below here, um, we have um, in the, in the back here by near the spine, that's where the entrance to the esophagus is. Um, forward anterior is the airway. Um, those, those horizontal lines that you see, that's, in, that's um, showing the vocal cords. And then the, um, there's a piece of cartilage above that area that's called the epiglottis. And its job is to um, invert, tip over as you complete a swallow to cover the airway and divert what you're swallowing posteriorly to the esophagus. Um, sometimes there can be some mistiming with that, that, that movement of the epiglottis or um, it, it won't, it's so weak, it's not inverting at all. And so that leaves the airway open and vulnerable. And so especially liquids can spill down towards the airway and pass through the vocal cords and that, that is um, term, that's aspiration. If we can go back one slide again. So with overt aspiration, what we mean by that is um, immediately after, within a couple seconds after swallowing, a patient starts coughing. Um, usually it can be a pretty significant cough. I think we've all experienced that in our life. Um, and that we, the, at the level of the vocal cords, you do have a cough reflex and that triggers a, a cough um, response in your brainstem. And its job then is to try to expel that material um, that has entered the airway. But um, with many of our patients, um, there can be more subtle signs than that. That's, you know, that's the most obvious. And that with your swallow screen, that's, that's a big one you're looking for. But some more subtle indications of issues with the pharyngeal phase of the swallow um, would include a wet, gurgly vocal quality. And what that's usually going to mean is um, they have some liquid or some um, saliva or maybe even food that remains in the pharynx and can spill over into the airway. And it's sitting there right on those vocal cords. And that's what you're hearing with it's vibrating against the vocal cords. And they either don't have the sensation that to t tell them they need to cough to clear or their cough is so weak is that horse breathy vocal quality that 
weak breathy cough that's listed below um, is kind of an indication that they, they have poor sensation and poor strength of that cough. Um, they might also show they have some sensation for it, but it just, they, they aren't really eliciting a strong cough, but they might be doing some throat clearing. So, <clears throat> and it sounds kind of a wet, gurgly throat clear. Um, and that, you know, temporarily gets it a, a, away from the cords up into the pharynx, but usually um, as soon as they're done with that throat clear, it's likely falling right back into the airway. Um, Another one you want to watch for, it's a little more subtle sign of issue, would be multiple swallows per bite and sip. What that's usually going to mean is that they, their swallow is weak, and so they're just not um, clearing all the, that, that bite or sip that they've taken. They're not able to clear that with that single swallow. So they need multiple swallows. They're probably getting little bits, hopefully, down the esophagus with each swallow. Possibly it's ineffective and it's just kind of staying in the pharynx. Um, the longer material stays in the pharynx, the more likely it is to start spilling towards the airway. And then the last one I have listed there is nasal reflux. And that, that can also occur with some of our stroke patients. And that's more related when they have um, some palatal weakness, soft palate. Um, as we swallow, the palate elevates and closes off the nose from the mouth. And, um, but sometimes that not happening. There's a little area, a little space, so especially liquids can leak up into the nose. Okay, so, and we can go forward again. Um, so those are the big things you're looking for as you're doing your swallow screen. Um, so with most swallow screens, there's kind of, it's usually kind of a two-step process, maybe three-step process. And the first one is, um, first step in the process is to determine if the patient is safe to participate in the swallow screen period. Um, there are some patients that are just, not, they're not safe to do, it's not appropriate. Um, and the one, the exclusion criteria that we have listed below are what we consider as those kind of red flags that they, they should hold off on completing your screen. So one of them is poor sustained alertness. Um, so say they're, they're very sleepy, as a lot of our stroke patients are, especially the hemorrhagic ones, um, and they just aren't able to maintain their alertness long enough to take the liquid into the mouth or the food into the mouth and actually finish the swallow before they doze off again. Um, they're not safe. Um, another one would be pa patients who are on flat or um, 30 degree head of bed restriction. Um, so they're not able to fully sit up um, to, to participate with the swallow screen. Um, that positioning thing puts them at much higher risk for aspiration and um, difficulty swallowing. So they should, that this exam should be deferred for them at least until maybe they get those they're cleared for a more upright sitting. Um, and then if they show poor saliva control, you know, they almost sound like they're drowning or on their secretions. So they show that wet, gurgly vocal quality and drooling. Um, that tells you they're just, they're not even swallowing their saliva safely or well. So um, they're at very high risk to have aspiration on any PO. Also, kind of going along with that can be if they show marked dysarthria um, with a noticeable facial droop and tongue deviation. Um, most of our patients are going to show some degree, you know, of that weakness. But these are the people that you really have a very difficult time understanding their speech, and they have that marked facial droop. Um, they should be deferred um, for the screen. And then if they show a poor or weak cough. So those patients who sound very wet and gurgly, you think they should be coughing to try to clear that out, or you tell them, you ask them to cough, and they just can't, or it's really weak. Um, that tells you they have poor airway protection and um, would be unsafe. And then the ones who I, we've mentioned before, intubated longer than 48 hours. That's kind of the hallmark we use with our assessments um, that, um, they should be deferred for speech pathology to assess or at least um, do, um, delay your exam for about 24 hours. Usually most people, um, 24 hours post extubation, they start to show some improvement. Okay. So next one. So um, 
we'll talk about what to do if you have to defer um, the screen. That's considered a fail right there. Um, but let's say your patient, um, you, their, their vocal quality sounds pretty clear. You're able to understand their speech. They might have some of that weakness, but you can still understand their speech. They're alert enough. Um, they're able to sit up. Those are the patients that you should go ahead and complete your screen. Um, we're not going to go into the specific screen how to because um, there are many kind of variations on that theme and every facility kind of has their own screen. But the thing we're going to talk about is what to look for as you're doing giving your presentations. Um, so as I'm doing a in a, a bit of an assessment. What I'm, I'm actually kind of looking at the patient's throat and kind of watching their face as they, they're doing the swallow. So you're kind of looking for those kind of behaviors. But then as they swallow, you want to listen for, are they coughing? Do they start to cough right away? Or maybe after a little bit of a delay, are they a little more subtly, are they do a throat, doing a throat clear? Um, um, are they outright choking <laughs> and, um, and they have that kind of <laughs> that breathlessness where um, they're trying to cough, but they can't even catch their breath in order to get, um, a, get a, a, a cough going. Um, those are, you know, the real signs of aspir overt aspiration there. But again, a little more subtly, um, you also do want them to vocalize. So have them say, ah, after each of the swallows along the way and listen for that if there's a wet gurgly vocal quality. That's also going to show tell you um, that um, they're not clearing well, their pharynx well, and there possibly could be some silent aspiration going on. So they've got some material, they're right at the level of the vocal cords, but they're, they're um, neurologically they're not sensing that that's occurring. They don't, their body doesn't um, tell them they need to cough. So those would all be signs of a fail. Um, and um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so you've done your exam, you've gotten your results. Um, so what next? Um, so again, what I was saying before is that a fail is also considered if the patient's not appropriate for the exam. That's a fail. And then any of those behaviors, the coughing, the choking, the wet, bro wet the vocal quality, um, what gurgly vocal quality, um, those are also signs of fail. So with those, you do want to keep them strict NPO um, and seek an alternative medication order if needed. Um, so, you know, if PO, diet or PO meds have been ordered, try to get, get it changed to IV um, suppository, whatever. Um, you may need to seek an order for a feeding tube um, if there are some medications that can't be given any other way and you need a method to give. Um, and then also you should request a, a speech path consult if one's not already ordered. Um, so that's for the fails. But let's say they pass the screen. So they maintain their clear vocal quality, um, no coffee, no choking. Um, and um, at that point, it depends on your facility, but at that point, definitely you can go ahead and give the PO meds um, that have been ordered. Um, some facilities will um, have a, a, a kind of a, a preliminary diet. If the pa patient passes the nursing screen, you can start them on a diet. Some will still keep them in PO until speech path assesses. So you would go with um, your facility. Um, procedure with that one, but you can go ahead. The biggest thing you do want to remember is um, document, document, document. So you want to document the time of the exam and whether the patient passed or failed. Because of course, with everything, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And you do want to you know, take credit for that great work you're doing every day. Um, some, just some, a little couple little things that um, challenges that you might have with um, completing the assessments. Um, one question we got was, well, what if a patient, um, you know, needs an interpreter, is, not, is a poor English speaker, or with a stroke patient who has poor comprehension? 
Um, a lot of times with that, um, usually, you know, use your visual cues and show them what you kind of want to do. A lot of them will kind of, you know, pick up with that, that context, that natural context of taking the swallows. Um, but if, if there is so much confusion that they're just not really understanding, that might be one of those other ones that um, they would they would be a hold for now. They're, they're not safe to participate in the exam because their comprehension is in such that they can really safely participate. So that, that would be another one that might be kind of in the fail um, mode. But um, I think, you know, I think nurses have a good idea or a good sense of, of um, some of those really overt issues and a good eye for things. So um, kind of trust yourself, you know, check with your colleagues and always use your speech pathology um, staff as, as a um, reference um, to, you know, provide a little more education and, and assist with that. So, thank you.